Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Dominican University of California. Are you happy to be here tonight? All of us are so happy. And this is one of our wonderful installments of the Leadership Lecture Series in partnership with Book Passage. And this is our eighth season. Yes. Our goal to ha of having these lectures is to provide socially relevant discussions with our community, our students, our faculty about effective leaders in a variety of disciplines. And so we've had a many, many events like this over the years, and we, we really enjoy them. Elaine and Bill Petricelli, the owners of Book Passage, make this happen because there are wonderful connections in the literary world, and we are so thankful to them. They bring amazing programs to our community. They just don't sell books, print and electronically. They have over 600 events a year, and they're not asking me to say this. I'm telling you how, how proud I am to be their partner. And to, should we thank them for building a community center in our town? So tonight's evening with Eve Ensler in conversation with Isabel Allende is a perfect setting for our lecture series because who, who more do they represent but great leaders? They have changed the world. Leadership is about change and they have done it through their actions and their words. In fact, the very first program that this institute held eight years ago Isabel Allende was the speaker at a luncheon and she talked about her foundation that supports women and girls around the world and it's just a, just a pleasure to have Isabel back on our stage again tonight. She's also a Dominican alum because she is a recipient of the honorary doctorate we have bestowed upon her. So Dr. Allende is what we call her here in the house. So I, I also wanted to just to say how excited we are that last Friday we held the Vagina Monologues play by our students, faculty, and staff. And so it's terrific, isn't it, to have Eve Ensler here a week later. I would like to thank our lead sponsor, Private Ocean Wealth Management, for their support because of their, their wonderful Funding all year, we've been able to host 13 events this academic year. And Susan Dixon is in, in, the, in the room, their chief financial officer. And hope, Susan, I wanted to thank you very, very much. We all do. Please, please, let's thank Private Ocean. <laughs> Private Ocean cares about our community, and we're, we're very thankful. Without further ado, Dr. Isabel Allende. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Who are the people who were in the vagina monologues in the play? Can you stand up? This year, now, recently. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Eve Ensler. And there, of course, there's a lot of people that I have to thank for this event, but I can't spend the next 10 minutes naming them. So just let me thank very, very rapidly, of course, Eve Ensler and her assistants, um, Susan Celia Swan and Tony Montanieri, two wonderful people. The Dominican University, of course, represented by Denise Lucy and her staff that have made this possible. Book Passage, my friend Elaine Petricelli and her staff, Amanda Jones, and the loyal women that work in my foundation, Lori Barra, Elizabeth Scheer, and Juliet Ambatsidis. Well, I had this very well organized, but the pages got all mixed up. <laughs> um, well, Eve Ensler, as you know, is an international best-selling author and acclaimed playwright whose work for the stage include the vagina monologues that everybody knows, necessary targets, and the good body. 
She's the founder of V-Day, a global initiative to end violence against women and girls. And we, now that we are talking <laughs> about this, Eve has launched the idea of one billion rising. Vag uh, v Day stands for violence, vagina, and Valentine. So <laughs> the next Valentine Day, instead of wasting your time with chocolates and flowers, you get out in the streets and dance and scream and yell and sing to, against um, violence for women. And if we can raise a billion voices, we can do a lot. I told her that it wasn't such a good idea because people like myself can't dance. If she can come with something easier than dancing, that would be better. In 2010 alone, more, by, more than 5,400 V-Day events took place in more than 1,500 locations in the US and around the world, from the Middle East to New York to Congo. V-Day funded more than 12,000 community-based anti-violence programs and safe houses in Congo and provided sanctuary from rape, abuse, genital mutilation, and honor killings. City of Joy is Eve's pet project. She will tell you about it. Today, we also celebrate her book, I Am an Emotional Creature, a collection of monologues spoken in the voices of teenagers from around the world that inspire girls to assume power over their bodies, hearts, and minds. No aspect of what girls encounter is left out. Beauty, friendship, love, sex, rape, violence, self-doubt, economic slavery, and more. Eve Ensler is a radical activist, survivor of incest, abuse, and cancer. Courageous, powerful, relentless, exhaustingly creative, emotional, tortured, devoted, and visionary. She is irreverent, funny, and outrageous. She's my hero. Forget Mandela and Mother Teresa. <laughs> I want to be like her. So please welcome Eve Ensler. I think you have to start with V-Day. Okay. <laughs> Can I just say, I cannot believe, first of all, that I'm here with all of you, all of you extraordinary activists, humans, thinkers, beings, but I'm just in awe that I'm here with Isabel Allende, who has been one of my heroes and role models and mentors forever. So I just, we need to take a moment to say, this is Isabel Allende. <laughs> She always skips over herself, but I'm going to just dwell in it for a minute. Um, um, V-Day, how did it start? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I always say that the best things that happen, and I was saying this earlier tonight, are accidents. You know, always when you're out planning your great piece of work and the thing that's going to be really amazing, it usually turns out to be pretty lousy. But when you're just accidentally taking notes about something, it develops on its own and it becomes something. In some ways, that's really what happened with V-Day. Um, when I started performing the vagina monologues, I, um, you know, it was all very um, accidental and, you know, I didn't really mean to write the vagina monologues <laughs> at all. <laughs> I was, it, was hearing a conversation with a woman and she was talking about her vagina. Is this really bumping <laughs> around a lot? Um, and because we were talking about menopause and she got onto the subject of her vagina, which you'll do if you're going through menopause, and <laughs> she said really horrible things about her vagina, which led to me being surprised, and, <laughs> and that got me to talk to other women about their vaginas, and I just said to a friend of mine, because I realized at that point I had no idea what women thought about their vaginas, I, I said to a friend, well, what do you think about your vagina? And, um, <laughs> 
And she said her mother used to tell her, don't wear panties underneath your pajamas, dear. You need to air out your pussycat. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of this insane journey um, that I've been on. And, uh, and um, you know how women are. Then she said, well, you need to talk to my, my friend. She has an incredible story about her vagina. And then she said, oh, but you need to talk to her. And, and then I was just kind of sucked down the vagina trail. And, um, <laughs> And it's now 17 years later, and I haven't gotten off, but, um, <laughs> but I didn't ever plan to write a play. I was just, it was just curiosity, right? Don't most things you start begin out of curiosity, right? Well, not vaginas, really. <laughs> <laughs> I had never even thought about mine, let alone look at it in a mirror before I saw the vagina monologues. Really? But then did you look at it in the mirror? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> It was a surprise. <laughs> Do we want to go into more detail or leave it there? Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, what happened was that I just was taking notes. And then I met a woman who was an older woman who had had a very humiliating experience when she was a young woman. Um, during sex with a boy, he had made her feel bad, and she had never had sex again. And I was completely shocked and disturbed, because frankly, sex is the best thing in the entire world. Um, and the idea that one would live one's life without pleasure and connection and intimacy on that level, it just felt just so sad and horrible. And I wrote this piece kind of an homage to her, and I read it one night, it was the flood, and I read it one night in a cafe, and everyone was like, oh, you really have to do this thing, you have to do this vagina thing. And I kept saying, I have no idea what this thing is. But one thing led to another, and eventually I wrote the piece. And I think when I started performing the vagina monologues, you know, it was really um, an unbelievable experience because every night women would line up after the show to talk to me. And um, at first I thought it would be great. I'd hear about their wonderful sexual experiences and their great desires. And their... But in fact, the reason women were lining up to talk to me is because they'd been raped or beaten or abused or incested or something really terrible had happened to them and they had never told anyone. And it was a very, very disturbing experience. And every city that I went to, the same thing happened. And I began to understand that violence against women um, was epidemic. Like, I certainly knew there was violence against women. I am a survivor. Um, my father incested me and beat me and almost murdered me. So I knew there was violence. But I had no idea of the epidemic proportions. And I was going to stop performing the play because I felt immoral, um, the way one feels when one doesn't intervene after one knows the story um, and the bad news. And in 1998, I got a lot of people together, um, in a, a group of women. I think everything begins in your living room with a group of women. It, I think the whole world has begun there. And, um, and, um, and one of those women was Susan Swan, who's here tonight, who's the executive director of V-Day, and who's been in V-Day with me on this journey for 14 years. Um, and she's here. Susan, are you here? You should stand up. Where are you? Is she here? Yes, she is. And we, we just said, we had this play, how can we use this play? Um, to end violence against women, not manage it, not contain it, not perpetuate it, but actually to end it. And I'm so crazy that I actually believe that's possible, and I certainly believe that when we started, that in five years we would be done. And then we could live in a world where women were free and safe and open and had their sexuality and could wear what they wanted and walk where they wanted and be who they wanted. So let's end it. And we started V-Day, um, which was Vagina Day, Anti-Violence Day, Valentine's Day, because it just seemed the perfect day to actually bring back love and safety and comfort and cherishing women into romance. Because for so many women, love has become very dangerous. We know that one out of three women on the planet will be beaten or raped in their lifetime, which would indicate that there's a unfortunate connection in a lot of relationships between what we call romance and violence. Um, and we started it on Valentine's Day 14 years ago, and we thought it would be one event in one night. And I invited all these great actors to come and perform. And I remember that I invited Marissa Tomei first, and she was like, I don't know, Eve, about doing, because she had seen the show, but she was like, you can do it downtown, but me. And then she said, okay. 
And because she said yes, I could then go to Glenn Close and say, you know, Marissa Tomei is doing it. <laughs> and then I, and, and, and so it went on like that. And eventually everybody said yes, from Lily Tomlin to Marissa Tomei to Rosie Perez. Um, it was in a Whoopi Goldberg. And we did this amazing performance in one theater in New York, and it just rocked the house. There were 2,500 people. By the end of Glenn Close's performance, she did the cunt piece, and the whole, it was like, ah, the whole place. <laughs> and we knew, we knew something had been born. We didn't know what it was, but we knew it. Um, and really, that was 14 years ago, and since that moment, you know, I love activists so much. I love women, I love men, I love, I love people who put their hearts on the line and say they want to change the world. And, you know, one woman came and said, I want to bring this to college campuses, and another woman said, I want to make vagina pajamas, and another woman said, I want to bring this to Pakistan, and another one, and it was just like that. Everybody just, everybody just took the vagina magic and spread it through the world. And, um, and I have to say, it's, here we are, it's, you know, 14 years later, and this year we have, I don't know, 50, 400 events in 2,000 places from Qatar. Um, on March 6th, I'll be with the women members of the European Parliament who are performing it at the Parliament. Um, we had ministers, uh, women priests and ministers performing it at a church in Ontario. I, I, we have migrant workers, Asian migrant workers in London performing it. If you just look down the list, it's like the women of the world are rising up. And we've been able, through the the efforts of people like the incredible students here who did it last week to raise $85 million to end violence against women and girls. Yeah. Thank you. When it, when it comes to, to inspiring people to do radical things, radical activism, why do you think that stories are so important? Sometimes. I feel that stories, listening or, or hearing somebody's story, can be more inspiring than all the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. I want to know your answer on that, too. Um, I'm not an activist. No. No, yes. I'm a bourgeois lady. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, wa I want room service. <laughs> activists who want room service. They don't know that they <laughs> contradict each other. Um, <laughs> you know, I was thinking a lot about stories because um, I think um, one of the, um, and I'm going to talk about City of Joy later because it's this amazing place that we, with the women of Congo, have opened in Bukavu, Congo. Um, but there's 12, there's 10 guiding principles at the City of Joy. And one of them is tell your story. Um, which is a governing principle. I think, I think there's a lot of reasons why stories change things. I think one, um, most of the time we live under a dominant narrative that's not our own. 99% um, of the people usually don't fit into the do dominant narrative. There's 1% that usually do. Um, that usually means women, people of color, gay people, poor people, middle class people, we can just go down the list, are just not within the dominant narrative. And I think when you tell your story, you suddenly bring yourself into the bigger story. You actually exist in the story. But I also think when we hear people's stories, people become real to us. They become specific, they become detailed, they become full, they become unfragmented, they, be, they, they, be, they are no longer abstract. And you suddenly see yourself in that person, or you see where you're not yourself in that person, but that is a really important thing to see as well. And I think my whole life, um, I just don't think there's anything as fascinating as listening to other people's stories. You know, I, I'm not a fiction writer like Isabel. Um, I, I just don't think I could create any fiction, and even though my p pieces are literary and obviously what I write is fictional, but people's lives are so incredible. And what people have survived, and what people have lived through, and what people have gone through. And most of the time, we don't tell anybody our story. Nobody really even knows what we think, or what we've been through, or our experiences. So, you know, I have a very lucky life now, because when people know it's me, they go, you're Eve Ansler? Oh, let me tell you. <laughs> and they usually like, it doesn't matter if I'm on an airplane, or in the next half hour, I will know who that person is sleeping with, how their sex is, what their past was like. But it's fantastic. I just can't believe what people live through. And I think, 
I think telling your story is a way of actually breaking taboos, um, challenging cultural norms, um, making yourself here, bringing yourself into the present. But also you are in the front line. You go to places where nobody else dares to go. And uh, I heard you tell a story, I think it was in Castileja uh, in the school, tell the story of how these girls or women who have been gang raped and they have fistulas and they have no control over their bowels and they are peeing on themselves all the time, some horrible stories. And you sit them on your lap and you hold them and you cry with them and you listen to the story. So, so that requires of you a stamina and a courage that I don't know where you get it. You know, I don't, I don't feel courageous. And, you know, I, I think, well, I, I think what you've brought up in me is I think that when you've been a product of violence and you survive something terrible in your own life, um, there's a kind of um, gratitude one has about that and an identification. I think w I made a bargain with whatever spirits there are in the world, and I don't know about God or whatever, but I made a bargain at a certain point in my life when I was on the verge of dying that if I didn't die and I got my sanity back, that I promised I would go back for the others. That was the deal I made. And, um, and I feel for myself that, for me, the only happiness I really have in the world comes from reaching out to people who are not having the experience I'm having right now. If people hadn't reached out to me at certain points in my life, I wouldn't be alive. I would have killed myself. I wouldn't have kept going because I was in such despair. And I know how easily one person can change another person's life. I know, I, if you all look back in your lives, there's like one teacher or one aunt or one person who came into your life at a certain point and made you believe that you weren't stupid or you had value or you were pretty or you had a right to be here. And I, and I think if we have opportunities to do that or I have an opportunity to sit with people who are being dismissed and destroyed and raped and undermined and hurt and I can be that person in that moment, that gives that person the possibility of belief that there's a reason to go on. I don't think there's anything better one can be doing with one's life. And I think it's selfish on my part because it feels good to do that. You must be some kind of saint, of modern <laughs> saint. It makes me so ashamed. <laughs> no, really, really, it does. Because I have a foundation and I do some work through the foundation, but, but the people who are there in the field doing what needs to be done, listening to the stories, those are the heroes. But I just want to—I just want to take issue with that to some degree because Isabel has, mm -hmm. since I've met her, supported me in ways and supported V days in ways I can't even tell you. I think we all do what we can do, and I think it's really important not to compare. Everybody's drawn to serve, and everybody. Isabel writes amazing books that change people's lives. Thank that you. change people's lives. Thank you. <laughs> And you create images, and you create ideas, and you create stories, and you create characters that fill us and take us on journeys. And that's a huge, huge gift to the world. And I think each one of us brings what we bring to the story. I think we, we sometimes make a hierarchy of what is more giving or what is of more service, and I think we do ourselves harm. I think each one of us is drawn to do different things, and it comes to us naturally to do those things. And I think, you know, anyway, I just, I just need to say, you've changed my life. You've made Thank my you. life a better life. You've okay. made me uh, a person who strives to be a better writer and to find better language and to create better ideas. So that's a huge gift. I have a very good translator. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, when I was young, like a hundred years ago, um, and I heard for the first time about the women, the, the women's lib. <clears throat> it seemed so rational, it seemed so logical that I thought, well, in 10, 15 years, this, this will be all over the world. We won't even be talking about this. And the patriarchy will be over. It was like so, such a natural thing. And although we have achieved a lot in my lifetime, there's still a lot to be done. And as soon as there is any crisis of any kind, occupation, invasion, economic crisis, fundamentalism, you name it, the first 
rights that are violated are the rights of women and children. And I have seen that over and over. I saw it in Chile and I have seen it many, many times. Um, so sometimes I get very discouraged because I know that in my lifetime I will not see the end of the patriarchy. But you have said repeatedly that this can be done and it can be done soon. So for all of us who are here, and, and in a way we all want to help, how can we make that possible? Not just by writing a check, but how, what do we have to do to make that possible? Well, first of all, I think we all have to believe that any patriarch is possible. Because I think the imagination is an energy, and it determines things. And I see how, you know, we put out a call on, on February 14th, um, for One Billion Rising to call next year One Billion Women, which is the number of women um, who will be beaten or raped in their lifetimes on the planet to have a general strike and walk out of their jobs, walk out of their offices, walk out of their families, walk out of their schools, and refuse the violence and to dance. Thousands and thousands of people signed up immediately from over 120 countries. A woman at the AP felt compelled to write an amazing article that she put out. And later she was questioned, like why did she take this seriously? Why did she believe something like that could even happen? And I started to think, now why would she get questioned like that? Why would people be doubting it? And I said, no, they weren't doubting it, they were afraid of it. And that's what we all have to look at. Why are we afraid for women to come to their rightful place of equality, to be cherished, to be honored, to be held as the amazing life givers that they are. Why are we afraid of love? It is so much more terrifying than violence. Violence is so easy, it's so easy. But love actually is terrifying. Connection is actually terrifying. To be intimate is terrifying. You tell me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having such problems with my husband. <laughs> but it is. It's really hard to be connected. And I think part of the thing is, do we really want to change the paradigm we're living in? Do we really want to do that? Do we really want to be living in a world where there is peace, where women are cherished, where there isn't rape, where there isn't violence? And I think it's something everybody has to ask themselves really deeply. If that is true, then what will you do in order to make that happen? How far will you go? What actions will you take? How radical will you be? How disruptive will you be? How misbehaved will you be? How loving will you be? How extreme will you be in order to make that happen? And, that, and I'm speaking to men here tonight because I feel like there are many, many good men in the world, many good men who don't rape, who don't beat women, who aren't unkind, but they don't stand up to the other men. And they don't say to the other men, why are you doing that? And they don't make ending violence against women and girls as important, for example, as football. And I will tell you something. If the men in this world made a decision that women being safe, their mothers and their daughters and their sisters and their wives, was as important as the Super Bowl, I promise you, violence against women would end tomorrow. It would end tomorrow. So I think it's a question of intention. What do we intend? What do we want? I have seen radical change across this planet in the last 14 years. I have seen women change and men change. I've seen vagina-friendly presidents stand up and declare themselves vagina-friendly. I've seen laws change. I've seen women stand up to their perpetrators. I've seen perpetrators confess that they're... I've seen amazing things, but what I haven't seen is the end of patriarchy. The bubble that we're still under, that we haven't busted out of yet, because we still a, don't believe it's possible, and still are not willing to go the distance that we need to go to make it happen. So the question is, how do we get more empowered, feel more emboldened, and do more outrageous, misbehaved, disruptive things? That's what I'd like to say. Yeah. And you know, I think that, that we are helped now by technology, by the media, we, we are connected. And uh, whatever happens here tonight, somebody will be twittering and you will hear it in a, in a village in Kenya or someplace. So that, that connection is very empowering. 
and I hope it will happen fast. I'm going to quote you. I know you one shouldn't do this, but I'll do it. Um, when you, you are a cancer survivor and you went through hell, you, I understand that you had like seven organs removed or something like that. I don't know how you're standing up. And you said at that point, real healing comes from not, from, from not being forgotten, from attention, from care, from love from being surrounded by a community of those who demand information on your behalf, who advocate and stand up for you when you are in a weakened state, who sleep by your side, who refuse to let you give up, who bring you meals, who see you not as a patient or a victim, but as a precious human being, who create metaphors where you can imagine your survival. This is my medicine and nothing less will suffice for the people, for the women, for the children of Congo. City of Joy is a wonderful community created by and for the victimized women of Congo. And I want you to talk a little bit about the Bansi Hospital, about this project, and how can we help? Um. You know, it's funny about cancer because um, I, I say this and I really mean this, that um, it really was the women of Congo who saved me and I don't think I would have lived um, through the cancer experience if I hadn't been living for the women of Congo. And I always, I, I, I really feel this the older I get that um, what's really important is the others, you know, all of you. <laughs> and. We're unfortunately brought up in a country sometimes where we think that we're what's important. Um, but the older I get, the happier I get because I realize that that's not the case, that serving and making other people happy is really what makes me happy. And not, not these fabulous pair of shoes or whatever, <laughs> although those briefly make me happy. They, do, they, don't make me, they, don't make me, they don't make me happy for a long time. What makes me happy is when I see this woman, Jeanne, who I want to talk about, who's now Jane, rise up and transform and become powerful and become healed and become alive and transform her suffering. Because the transformation of suffering is the greatest happiness. And um, City of Joy, for me, is, is, is a miracle. And it's really why I've become much more radical than I've ever been because I know now that transformation of, of pain to power is so super possible and it can happen very quickly. Um, I met Dr. Denis McGuege um, five years ago and he is a saint um, uh, or as close to a saint as I've met in this lifetime. He's a doctor, a Congolese doctor who works um, in Bukavu and ha for 13 years has been working with um, women survivors of the worst atrocities on the planet rape and torture. Um, he's been sewing women's vaginas up as fast as the militias are ripping them apart. He's seen babies be raped. He's seen five-year-olds be gang raped. He's seen 80-year-old women. He's seen atrocities that I can't even talk to you about tonight because they're too gruesome to talk about. But he's been there for 13 years, um, first in the bush doing this where his hospital and all most of his team were murdered. And then he moved to and he built a place called the Pansy Hospital in Bukavu, which serves between 200 and 300 women at any given time. And most of them are rape survivors who he is healing in one way or another. I met him five years ago. I was asked to interview him at the request of the UN. And I didn't want to interview him, to be honest, because we were already working in Afghanistan and Bosnia and Haiti and we were already full up and I didn't know how we could expand and I knew that there were terrible things going on in Congo. But when I met this man, um, my whole life changed. His eyes were literally bloodshot, um, I really believe from the suffering he was witnessing and I couldn't believe there was a man who was that kind and that tender and that generous and that beautiful on the planet and he invited me to come to Congo and I went and I um, went to Pansy Hospital and I spent weeks there interviewing women who um, had fistula, which is a hole between their rectum and their vagina or their vagina and their bladder. Um, and many of them had fistula from the gang rapes and from the sticks and from the horrible things that were being shoved inside them. The war in Congo is a war that's being fought over minerals, uh, minerals that go into our cell phones, coltane, and our playstations and our computers. 
and um, copper and gold that gets shipped out and exported to the rest of the world, indigenous minerals that actually belong to the Congolese but are being pillaged and, and, um, and, and taken by the rest of the world. And the way it works is that militias go into communities, um, they rape women, they have husbands rape daughters, they have sons rape mothers, they desecrate the family structure, they destroy everything and fragment it, the family flees and they take over the village and by doing so they take over the mines. So that these rapes have now become femicide, a, a systematic tactic which is being used methodically to destroy women's bodies as a way of destroying community and as a way of destroying Congolese futures, the future of the Congolese. And when I spent those weeks at Pansy Hospital with the women, um, to be honest with you, I was shattered. Um, I don't think I've ever really recovered. I don't think I ever really will recover. Um, I've never really slept since then, normally. Um, I think when you witness those kind of atrocities and you have people that close to you and you can feel their body shaking or where women are crawling around on the ground having flashbacks in the middle of telling you stories, um, and you know that you're living in the world that has technology and the world knows what's going on to the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of women are being raped and the six million people who have been murdered and you can't imagine why the world hasn't risen up to stop that, um, something changes inside you. And I think for me, um, I knew and Vide knew that we had to direct our energies towards the Congo because there was really no other place we could direct our energy. And so five years we have worked with the women and men on the ground to create campaigns, to break silences, to create incredible events that are disruptive and disturbing. They've been doing vagina monologues across the whole country. They've been doing it in churches. They've been, um, but we really said to the women a few years ago, what do you want us to do? Because the way V-Day works is that we are, have a non-colonial you know, model, we are, Really, V-Day is a very virtual organization. There's only 12 of us, and um, we work from our homes. We don't even have an office. And we basically asked the women of Congo what they wanted, and they said, we want a place that we can be safe, where we can be healed, where we can, t where we can become leaders, where we can really turn our pain to power. And so we built a city. It's truly a city. It's this beautiful little city in the middle of a war zone and in the middle of... Um, despair in the middle of insane poverty. There's no electricity most of the time. There's no water. There's no structure. There's no government a lot of the times in Eastern Congo. But what there is, is this spirit, this indomitable spirit. And we opened City of Joy um, um, six months ago in February. It's a place where women are healed through therapy and dance and all kinds of techniques. Um, there's massage, there's um, self-defense, there's literacy, there's um, women are learning to speak English, there's communications, there's civics, there's training, there's everything. And um, our first group came in February, and I have to tell you, I've been in a lot of places and I've been in a lot of experiences, but my experience of City of Joy has given me more hope than any experience I've had in my entire life because 41 women were the pilot group. Now there's 90, but there were 41 women in the first group. And when the women arrived, they were completely traumatized. Many women had no um, reproductive parts. Um, some women had bullet holes in their head. Um, the level of trauma was not to be believed. There were nightmares every night. There was screaming every night. There was insomnia. Um, some women were aggressive. But every woman had made a commitment to be a leader and had promised that she would, whatever she went through, would bring that back to her community. And um, the women went through this amazing process with these 10 principles, which they have turned into this gorgeous anthem that they dance to. It's the most beautiful anthem. Um, and this community became a place of joy. I mean joy. I have to tell you, I never knew joy until I went to the city of joy. We don't really know joy in this country. We don't really know joy. We know desire, we know we could get more, we know we're happy for a minute but it's not enough, but we don't know joy, joy, unabashed, open, grateful joy. And um, I spent January with the women, every day we danced for hours. Um, I was given, I have a passion for goats, probably because I'm a city person and I've never had a goat. And. Um, <laughs> 
the women gave me a baby goat named Faraha, which is Joy, and they gave me a mama goat named Awa, which is Eve, because they told me that Eve gave birth to Joy, um, which is my favorite thing in the whole world. And I had my baby goat, and I just walked all day with my baby goat. And the women of Congo are like, why are you holding the goat? And um, um, what's up with the goat, you know? And um, I was like, it's a goat. And they were like, yeah, it's a goat, you know? Um, but for me, the goat was just this doorway um, to everything. And um, over um, the time I was there, I listened to what had happened to the women. And I just want to tell two stories. Um, one woman named Jackie um, had been raped very badly. And then she went back to her community, and she was gang raped. And um, she was um, held in a hole for months, and she was pregnant. And they didn't let her out of the hole. And they just dropped things in occasionally for her to eat as her baby grew. And when her baby was born, um, it had the face of one of her rapists. And she hated her baby. She couldn't love her baby. And she used to let her baby um, kind of fall sometimes, and she wouldn't pick her up. But she hated herself for hating her baby. And she really wanted to come to City of Joy for one reason. She just wanted to learn how to love her baby. So here's a woman who has been through the worst atrocities in the world, and all she wants to do is learn to love her baby. And when she came to City of Joy, she didn't know how to love her baby, and she went through this whole process. And um, she stood up on one of the days that I was there, and she said, I, I want to tell my story. And she told the whole story, and then she said, and I now love my baby. And I was there when her five-year-old daughter came, and I saw her with her daughter. And I knew that she loved her daughter. I knew that all of the hate was gone. And I knew they probably had a journey to go through because her daughter was a bit estranged. Because, but I knew she would, in five years, be bonded with her daughter and would get through all that. And I thought to myself, now this daughter will grow up knowing that her mother fought to love her that she went to a place for six months and worked on herself deeply so she could come to love her because she was that important. And um, that's a radical act of change. And then there's one other story, which is the story of a girl who, whose father basically had um, exiled her when she was a child and thrown her out and thought she was worthless. And then she was raped, and her father decided she had no value and was selling her and just throwing her away and like she was garbage. And she came to City of Joy. And she was loved, and she was nurtured, and she learned to read and write. And in the middle of her stay, she wrote her father a letter, and she said, I've already forgiven you, because I know you don't know who I really am, because I just found out who I really am. But I'm going to give you a chance to love me. And he invited her to come home, and he saw her, and he saw the change in her, and he was just blown away. And he was like, of course, I love you. And he started introducing her to all his friends, how proud he was. And at the graduation, the father stood there on stage, and he said, this is my daughter. I'm so proud of her. She's our legacy. She's our future. She's my daughter. And we all just sat there weeping. But I tell you these two stories because most people would have believed that was impossible. As a matter of fact, the governor of the Kivus was at the graduation. and. Um, He's a really amazing character, and he was wearing a V-men's T-shirt and declaring himself a vagina-friendly governor, and, which was quite remarkable. And um, the next day after the graduation, he had heard all the speeches he called, and he said, um, I'm going to be honest. I never believed that we, as Congolese, had that much value, as I saw on that stage yesterday. I never believed it. Those were the poorest women in this country, and they were radiant and they were brilliant, and they were shining, and they were beautiful. I never knew we had this much value because colonialism and racism and years of being pillaged and years of being invaded and intervened upon has robbed the Congolese of an understanding of their value. And if you had told that governor a year ago that it was possible, he would have told you it was impossible, in the same way that we believe it's impossible to end patriarchy. So it's all about how much faith you have in people's capacity to change and people's capacity to rise and how much you're willing to love people and to give to people of yourself to make that happen. What, what do 
you do with the men. They also are victims of a system. They have been also violated and raped by colonialism and exploitation, and now by the corporations that want the mines. How do you start healing them so that they can be part of this process? What do you think? I want to know what you think. I think that I would do like the monkeys and the dolphins, sex. That's what I would do. <laughs> But healthy sex, joyful sex. Every time they start bothering, sex. <laughs> that, could, that could be good. Sounds good to me. Yeah. But, but I don't know what to do, really. I, I always wonder, because in my lifetime, I've always been working with women and for women, and I feel that half of the world is left out. Uh, the women like myself that have raised boys, uh, we, can, we can change our boy, we can, these are the children of feminists, but what happens with the rest of them? How do we reach them? You know, we've been doing a lot of work in V-Day. Um, there's now something called V-Men, and there's a whole you know, parallel ally movement rising up, and there's wonderful men working in the movement to end violence against women. There's a great group called, called the Men, Men Can Stop Rape. There's fantastic work being done. And one of the things I saw in Congo, which I was really moved by, because so much of the rape that's happening in Congo is happening from outside countries, you know, from Rwandese and Ugandese and Burundis. Uh, not to say that there's not Congolese raping men, raping there are, but so much of it's coming from the outside. And there's a real V-Men's movement in Congo. And one of the things, I, I was in a meeting recently with about 150 Congolese men who were talking about um, their, their vulnerability and how disturbed and how um, upset they are by what's happening to the women in Congo. And what I saw is how little space men have to share their grief, how little space men have to share their doubt, how little space men have to share their vulnerability and their tenderness, how we live in this world where everybody's taught to man up and be a dude and get your man thing together. And we all do it to men. Women do it to men, men do it to men, mothers do it to men, fathers do it to men, we all do it to men. We don't really want a world where men cry or men are lost, which they are, by the way. You know, I think one of the, the things about men is we don't even let them ask for directions, which to me is such a metaphor for everything, you know? <laughs> So instead, men just walk around lost, pretending they know where we're going, and we're forced to follow them, you know what I mean? And I think part of it is, what if we actually created a world where men could say, I'm lost? Because most of my close male friends feel lost. Most of the men I know who are tender and open don't really even know what it means to be a man in the world anymore. Because so many, much of the rules have changed, and so much of the ground is shifting all the time. And, you know, I say this often, and it may sound simplistic, but if I couldn't cry, which I do a lot, I would be insane. I don't know what men do with their tears, and often I think that bullets are hardened tears. I think if we tell boys they can't cry, if we tell boys they can't feel, if we tell boys they can't be tender, what happens to them? What happens? They become violent. Of course they become violent. What alternative do they have? So part of it is how do we create space where men can feel their tenderness and feel their girl cell, that part of them that is, that's passionate and devoted and open-hearted and crazy, wild, and doesn't have answers and wants to be. We have to create a world where men can be that way. And that has to do with men helping other men stand up for that world. I don't know that women can do that for men. I think men have to do that for each other. Well, when men get together, they play drums in right. the forest, <laughs> or they, they do stuff like that. So without the intervention of women, I don't know how you're going to get there. No, I, th I think there are many good men who actually can speak to men. I think the problem is that so, there, there is so much taboo against men. We need 10% of the men to come forward, and I think the rest of the men will begin to come. But I think they have to be the brave 10% who begin to start to articulate. Like last night I spoke at Stanford and this really adorable guy stood up and he was like, okay, I want to tell you about all the girl movies I watch and I really am tender and when I'm by myself I cry all the time. And, and I was like, okay, one, one in the room has stood up. You know? And the other, the other time I was on, the other day I was on an airplane and I, was, I walked through the aisle, you know, aisles and I was looking at all these men and, who were 
by themselves, and they were all watching what is called chick flicks. And I thought, now, no one knows they're watching these movies, right? But I have found them out, you know? And, and I, I think sometimes that there's a whole other world going on in men that we don't allow them to articulate and allow them to share because it's not what there's, but that's just my interpretation. I would love to hear from men what they're feeling about that. Well, we are almost there, and you haven't talked at all about the book, about I'm Emotional Creature, and I want you to explain what the book is about and talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm an Emotional Creature is a book that I wrote over a period of time about um, teenage girls, but it's really about the girl inside all of us. Um, and my experience traveling around the world was that I met many girls, um, and you know, girls and girl energy is fierce, revolutionary energy. It's emotional, it's passional, it's intense, it's alive, it's devoted, it's brilliant, but it's heart, head, coming together energy. And I know when I was a girl, I was told every day, and I bet this is true for you too, that I was too intense, too emotional, too alive, to this, to, 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 to. Um, as a matter of fact, they called me Sarah Bernhardt and they would ask me to stop being Sarah Bernhardt. And I had no idea who she was, I just knew I wanted to be her, you know? And, um, and I, I grew up believing that everything about me was too much and too big and too whatever for the world. And I see how we do that to girls and I see how we do that to boys. I see how we mute people and make them less and make them behave and make them conform and make them... Even with my granddaughter who's 15, you know, she loves to short skirts. Do you know? I just see her rolling her skirts up all the time. And everyone's saying to her, don't roll your skirt up, it's too short. And I finally said the other night, why? Why can't she wear... A, what, why? She likes her body. She likes the way it feels to walk down the street in her short skirt. It feels good. Why are we telling girls not to be alive, exposed, here, sexual, themselves? Because what we're communicating to them is to shut everything down and to shut more down and to shut more down. So finally, by the time you get to do your 40s, you're like, hello, I am here. I am sort of in my body, but not really. I have learned how to behave. I had an orgasm 10 years ago. It was good, do you know? Um, and really, I think what we're telling women is not to shine, not to know, not to be brilliant, not to be alive. And we're telling boys not to be intense, not to be... So the book was a real attempt to change the verb from please, which is what we're bringing girls up to do, to please, to please their mothers and be behave, to please churches to please, fashion setters to please. We, you just go down the list of who you're pleasing every minute of the day. And to change the verb to create, to envision, to invent, to dance, to desire, to refuse, whatever it is, but please. We just need to put please on the back burner for the next 50 years and come back to it later. <laughs> come back to it later. So, so the book is really all these girls around the world who are either in the state of pleasing, withdrawing from pleasing, or refusing to please in various circumstances. And we were able to begin the process of turning it into a play, which we started in Johannesburg last summer, and it was rocking. And we cast these amazing girls from South Africa, from Zimbabwe, one girl from America, and they launched the play there. And it was the most exciting thing we bought high schools and middle schools in every morning and by the end of each performance they were dancing on the stage. Um, and then we moved to Paris and we're opening at Berkeley Rep in June. Yeah. So Please I... Get the tickets now because they're going fast. Yeah. And just really, it's a real call to be your emotional creature. And I heard a great story yesterday or today that somebody told me where a girl was in her class and um, she had written something. Oh, she got very upset when, oh, her teacher humiliated her and um, told her that she had a crush on a boy in front of the class. And she was felt really terrible and the next day she stood up and she was really upset about it and her teacher said, why do you have to take things so intensely? And she stood up and she had just read the book the day before and she said, because I am an emotional creature. <laughs> I was like, yes! Woo! Um, and she didn't apologize for it. She didn't shut it down. And she didn't say, I'm sorry. She said, I'm alive. I'm in my body. I'm in my being. I'm emotional. 
And we're meant to be about Why were we given all these feelings when we weren't meant to have them? Who told us we're not supposed to have them? And I think if we put them together with our minds, then we actually have the synergy to become activists, to become revolutionaries. If you don't have your emotion connected to your ideas, then you become an academic, which is great, wonderful. <laughs> it's great. Not putting it down. I love that. But we need the academy and the body to come together. That's where change in the world will come from. Well, this was absolutely wonderful. And if you could please do one of the monologues to inspire the actresses here so that the next time, instead of the vagina monologues or the vagina monologues, but also this new play, please, I want to be invited. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just want to say that, um, you know, I sometimes when I'm with Isabel, I feel like she's so insanely honest about everything that it's almost... Um, I don't know, it's just like... I'm too old to pretend. I know. <laughs> I have nothing, nothing to lose no, anymore. No, I know, but I, I really, lost everything already. But we were having this discussion last night at Stanford <laughs> about honesty and about how writing is about being progressively more and more honesty and peeling the layers away. And I just want to say your honesty has pushed me to be more and more honest. Thank and you. And I want to thank, thank you, you for that. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for that. Um, so. All right, so I'm going to read this piece called Refuser. And I want to do it tonight for all the girl, all the girls here, and that includes the boys, um, the uh, girls wait, who wait, have. Wait a minute. There's something very beautiful that you said, uh, and I heard you say that, that we have a girl inside. Everybody, boys too. Everybody has a girl inside. Everybody has that wild, intense, emotional creature, and I think it's such a beautiful idea that even Willie, my husband, has a girl inside. Yeah. Oh, God. I, I, did, I did this talk at TED India, and I was very nervous because TED is a very male, um, it's a very yeah. masculine place, and I did this talk on the girl cell, and I thought, I'm crazy. I don't even know why I'm doing this. It's like suicide. But at the end of it, um, I did this whole talk about identifying and finding your girl cell. I thought if I talked about cells, it would sound like TED, and it would sound biological, and you know. <laughs> And at the end of it, there were a line of men that came up to talk to me, and there was one wonderful man, and he came up to me and he said, I don't know how to tell you. My whole life, I have told my wife, we need to have boys, we need to have boys. I'm going home to make girls. <laughs> I'm going to make girls. And he said, I want to tell you that my inner girl thanks you. My inner girl. <laughs> so, yeah. So I hold that man in me all the time. Um, so this is called Refuser. From the Lebanese mountains to the Kenyan village of El Duret, we are practicing self-defense. First in karate, tai chi, judo, and kung fu, we are no longer surrendering to our fate. Now we are the ones who walk our girlfriends home from school, and we don't do it with macho, uh-uh. We do it with cool. Our mothers are the pink sorry gang fighting off the drunken men with rose-pointed fingers and sticks in Uttar Pradesh. The Perjmerga women in the Kurdish mountains with barrettes in their hair and AK-47s instead of pocketbooks. We are not waiting anymore to be taken and retaken. We are the Liberian women sitting in the African sun blockading the exits till the men figure it out. We are the Nigerian women babies strapped to our backs, occupying the oil terminals of Chevron. We are the women of Caroline who refuse to let Coca-Cola privatize our water. We are Cindy Sheehan showing up in Crawford without a plan. We are all those who forfeited husbands, boyfriends, and dates because we were married to the mission. And we know love comes from all direction and in many forms. We are Malila, who spoke back to the Afghan lawyer Jirga and told them they were raping warlords, even though they kept trying to blow up her house. And we are Zoya, whose radical mother was shot dead when she was only a child, so she was fed on revolution, which is stronger than milk. And we are the ones who kept and loved our babies, even though they have the faces of our rapists. 
We are girls who stop cutting ourselves to release the pain, and we are the girls who refuse to have our clitoris cut and give up our pleasure. We are Rachel, Corey, who wouldn't, couldn't move away from the Israeli tank. We are Ansa Su Yi, who can now leave her room. We are Anne Frank, who survived because she wrote down her story. We are Netta Seltani, gunned down by a sniper in the streets of Tehran as she voiced a new freedom and way. We are Asma Mafus from the April 6 movement in Egypt, twittering and uprising. We are the women riding the high seas to offer needy women abortions on ships, and we are women documenting the atrocities in stadiums with video cameras underneath our burqas. We are 17 and living for a year in a tree and laying down in the forest to protect the wild oaks. And we are out at sea interrupting the whale murders. We are freegans, vegans, and trans people. But mainly, we are refusers. We don't accept your world, your war. We don't accept your cruelty and unkindness. We don't believe some need to suffer for others to survive or there isn't enough to go around or that corporations are the best and only economic arrangement. And we don't hate boys, okay? That's another bullshit story. <laughs> we are refusers, but we crave kissing. We don't want to do anything we're ready before we're ready, but it could be sooner than you think. And we get to decide. We are not afraid what is pulsing through us. It makes us alive. Don't deny us, criticize us, infantilize us. We don't accept checkpoints, blockades, air raids. We are obsessed with learning. From the barren tsunami beaches of Sri Lanka, in the desolate and smelly remains of the Lower Ninth, buried under the rubble and debris of Port-au-Prince, we want school. We want school. We want school. We know if you plan too long, nothing happens and things get worse. And the most everything is found in the action. And instinctively, we get that the scariest thing isn't dying, but not trying at all. And when we finally have our voice and come together, when we let ourselves gather the knowledge, when we stop turning on each other and direct our energy towards what matters, when we stop worrying about our frizzy-ass hair and our fat stomachs and our fat thighs, when we stop caring about pleasing and making everyone so incredibly happy, we got the power. If Janis Joplin was nominated the ugliest man on her campus, and they sent Angela Davis to jail, if Simone Weil had manly virtues and Joan of Arc was hysterical, if Bella Abzug was eminently obnoxious and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is considered scary, if Arundhati Roy is totally intimidating and Rigoberto Menchu is pathologically intense, call us hysterical then. Fanatical, eccentric, delusional, intimidating, eminently obnoxious, militant bitch, freak, tattoo me witch, give us our broomsticks and portions on the stove because we are the girls who aren't afraid. To cook. You are so wonderful. So wonderful. Woo! Rising! Are we going to do questions or no? Everybody you know to do the same, will you raise your hand? Thank you.